All right, we're back and we're chatting about comic books again because this is what we do every week, guys. Sometimes more than once. This is our life now. This is what I do every single day. And I freaking love it. For real though, every day I do something with comic books. Yeah, that's true. I mean, if it's not all day, it's at least a part of the day. Right. I'm doing something with a comic book. All right, so we're here. We're chatting about comic books. But before we do that, we got to tell you about our sponsors who make this show possible. We have Key Collector and the Mystery Mail Call. Boom. That's right. So Key Collector Comics, this is the best application that exists on the interwebs. If you hit the link in the description, you can download it on both Android and iTunes. So if you have both types of phones, you can double up. And what's cool is if you use the code TOM101, you get a free week subscription. Now, what's really dope about Key Collector is that it focuses on the key issues as well as comic books that actually have some value. And it drowns out the rest of like basically 95% of like the catalog of comic books that exists in the world so that when you're out on the hunt, you can look at the ones that are actually worth your time. It's like your little um, comic book guru you got in your pocket or shoulder. That's right. And what about the mystery mail call, Ryan? That's our comic subscription service. It's awesome. It's also in the description below if you want to join the community. We package comic books every single month in a box with care and love and send them to you monthly. Now, in that box, you're going to find four to seven comic books. And one of those books every month is an exclusive book. And this month's exclusive is courtesy of Scout Comics. If you go to scoutcomics.com and use the code TOM101, you actually get 10% off of your entire purchase. Thanks so much to James. Shout out. And this month, we're going to have a Gut Ghost number one exclusive going out to every member in the September box. You got until the 15th of the month. It's only a few days left to reserve your box. Hit the description below and join the community. Let's get into the show. I'm pretty stoked today because we got Golden Age sitting on the table. Dude, that book's worth a few thousand. I oh, shouldn't have told there. me that, man. I don't like knowing that. I'm sitting too close to something that's worth too much. <laughs> we'll get into yeah, that. That makes me feel better. But Jeff, before we... Like, we have a whole script here. We got news on comics. We're talking about, like, cameo versus full appearances. Donny Cates is on the list, as he always is. We got some really interesting stuff, like what is underneath Things Rocks, Right? The thing from Fantastic Four. We're gonna, oh, it's gonna be fun. It's okay. gonna be fun stuff. Yeah, forgot about but, that one already. Yeah. But we gotta talk about Ron, our homie. Ron Murray. Shout out to you, Ronnie. Uh, so I went to Chicago for Chicago Wizard, and that was about a week and a half ago. And just as I get home, I get a message from my bud, Ron, saying on Craigslist, somebody is selling some vending machines. And I was like, looking at it, and I was like, that is freaking dope. Like candy vending machines? Oh, no, no. A comic book vending machine that they used to have. So you could buy your comics from a vending machine. Like, imagine that. Like, and it kind of rolls out. And we're not talking like Transformers roll out. No, okay? you mean like ludicrous roll out. Like ludicrous. <laughs> because it was 12 cents on one of the machines. And you guys have to see the pictures on it. But they just kind of flop in there and they okay. kind of flop out. I thought you meant like you go up to the machine, you push like F7, and then your comic just like <laughs> just, kapunk, just like falls down. Corner. Yeah, just you're, you're screwed already. Like Instant fine comics. Yep. I, and I got to tell you, if I was there, I, I would have bought those. I mean, there was enough people driving back to this coast that I, I definitely would have just been like, how do you not want a comic vending machine? Either just a display or just to put in 12 cents just to see it flop out. I actually went to Comics Place in Bellingham, gorgeous shop, and they have one of those Zippo like stands. It's like a rotating stand on the inside. It's like a got a, a little motor that spins it in circles. They took off the Zippo and put Key Comics, and they have comics in there on rotation, like just nice books. Oh, I saw you post a video of that. Yeah, it's pretty that cool. cool. Something else that's cool is the community's response to last week's podcast. Oh boy, yeah. I know, Ryan, you were a little nervous talking about this subject. Yeah. I am. I'm not. I'm not really qualified necessarily to talk about it, but it's it's a topic. It is We're a going topic. back to it, man. It's it's been a topic like the whole damn week. Well, we had some conversations here, and we're also sitting at the table with someone who is, you know, say is like pretty heavily invested in Hulk 181s. Oh yeah. How many you got right now? If you want to share. Twenty three. Yeah. I think. <laughs> okay. I, gonna, I thought you were gonna say like three, four. No, no, no. no. This guy no. don't mess around. No, so, he doesn't. No, he so doesn't. So we're talking about Hulk one eighty one eighty one, and one of the things that was brought up in the community discussion is that because we we talked about it last week that Hulk one eighty was credited in one of the House of X previews as the first appearance of Wolverine, not cameo, first appearance. And in the comment section, a number of our members said, 
Well, Marvel's always said that. They've always said Hulk 180 is the first appearance, right? Well, guess what? Key Collector's posting today a, a, sh a full shot of Marvel, a preview of, in a comic book saying that, no, they said 180 is a cameo and 181 is the first appearance. So guess what? Not even Marvel has it right. They don't even know what's going on. Yeah, this is tough because, I mean, we see this with a lot of books, okay? And we start getting to that, that realm of prototypes, cameos, first appearances and it's like I think it throws off a lot of people is because of the lingo that we're using and there's a lot of examples that we, that we, we all get kind of confused on and that, I don't know some clarification just needs to be had so some people think well let's just look to the writers and artists like the people who actually create this stuff and this week Donnie Cates answered a couple tweets and we got to jump into that. Got to mention Sir Cates. At know. least once, man. He's, he's such an active presence on like Twitter comic community. All right. So someone tweeted out and said, yo, a couple questions. First thing is uh, CGC considers that Dylan's first appearance is issue number nine as the full appearance. But issue seven's listed as a cameo. What do you think of that? Donnie Cates' response? Dumb. He says that's dumb. Yeah. This is somebody who disagrees with the CGC and he created the damn character. So then there's another tweet because like right off the gate, you're like, okay, so he's considering a cameo. So, I mean, there's only like five panels in that issue. It's technically not even his first full appearance because it's kind of a flashback. So Donnie continues this conversation by answering another tweet because they, they say, what about null? And they also ask him just to clarify, it's not canal, right? And he says, no, no right. it's, it's null. Canal, it's not. He says, well, no. Well, of course, his first appearance is Venom issue three. That's a problem. Yeah, it goes a little back further than that. I thought it was uh, in Thor, in the Thor run, Jason Aaron. That's right. You know, they've crossed over these runs in Thor, uh, God of Thunder, issue number six. You have the first appearance of Null, and you also have all over the internet on Marvel's database and everything saying that that is his first appearance, even if he's uncredited. So even Sir Cates is inconsistent with his cameo versus first full. Let's keep this conversation going because it gets even muddier. Because what were we talking about just a few months ago at Major X, Ryan? There was the, uh, the Rob Liefeld versus the Spider-Man Deadpool conversation on which one was the actual first appearance of the Major X character. That's right. In Spider-Man Deadpool, issue number 47, completely different writing team. Rob Liefeld had nothing to do with this comic book. The artist drew Major X in the background thinking, oh, it'd be kind of a fun little nod to something that's coming out. Problem is, Rob Liefeld didn't like that. This is what he tweeted. Let me tell you, Spider-Man Deadpool number 47 is in no way the first appearance of Major X. It came out a week after Deadpool number 10. I'm giving it notice by mentioning it here, but I will never, ever sign a single copy. Deadpool number 10 came out a week before as I anticipated a clown move like this. A clown move. Holy smokes. Okay, so basically Rob's throwing some shots here because he put a, it's essentially a web exclusive. He sold this on his site and it's a variant to Deadpool, issue number 10. And there's two different covers to it. And he's saying, well, the cover appearance is the first appearance. Yeah, this never hit the newsstand. I mean, this is something sold on his site that he's trying to just get, maximize as much money as possible. Okay. And so it's a cover appearance. Yet the one came out on the newsstand gets the credit for being the first appearance and he's pissed about that i mean i get it like this just you know, like you said just muddies it up because we already got prototypes and cameos and first appearances and now we have like first appearances that never hit the public newsstand it's all problematic everyone in the comment section last week had something different to say like there was very little consensus except for the fact that hulk 181 is a clear choice for a lot of people as that pick for the first full appearance. Even technically, 180 has a full appearance of the character. I mean, you have word bubbles. You have the name written there. But let's uh, see if we can maybe clean this up because I want to share our opinion because I think the answer to this may lie in these two books. So being one of the most recognized books and some, one that we can all kind of relate to and really put on a pedestal maybe should be the benchmark because I really think it hits on all levels and can kind of expose maybe some confusion, which I think really lies in some of this terminology. So when we have something, let's say prototype, that's going to be like the development of the character. You know, they're still trying to form a character, see how it plays out. And then we have cameo, which is kind of the introduction in a way of a character. 
and just bringing him to light or the universe in a way. Kind of like ramping up for that next issue because like that's how comic books are written. It's like a tease in my mind, right. like a like a teaser trailer, like getting you kind of psyched up for the potential, the possibility of this character kind of growing yeah. later on. And we usually see that like at the end of a story on the page, like, oh, look what's coming next. Happens all the time. Happens all the time. Like every issue of every comic ever ends with a cliffhanger. And I think the biggest thing that throws people is the term first appearance. Yeah, I think we need to throw that out. It's yeah. useless. Yeah, I mean, we that appearance just throws you... Because you're assuming first appearance is you're seeing something for the very first time. And really what we're seeing trend-wise for the collectible market and value is more of the character's first appearance in a continuity of story. Full appearance. Full. Not just seeing him for the first time, but actually integrated into the book. Now... This crosses generations of comics, too. This has been a problem since the Golden Age, has it not? I mean, we've had issues with this in the Golden Age, Silver Age, and there's lots of examples. I mean, one of the main examples I want to bring up is kind of more late or early silver, really, is um, Sergeant Rock. I mean, that guy, okay, so he has a prototype, GI Combat 68, where he's called The Rock. All right, he's brought into existence for the first time. And then... Two, three months later, he's in another title, Our Army at War 81. This used to be considered really his first appearance, okay? And he was called Sergeant Rocky. The next issue, 82, became the first mention of Sergeant Rock. And then 83 is Sergeant Rock really in his first full story. Okay. 81, 83 kind of traded around the same value in 2005. And now, 83 has skyrocketed. And I'm talking skyrocket. I'm saying 5.5 just sold for $4,800. But a 6.0 of 81 only sold for 840 bucks. Wow. So we saw that separation now. This is, what, 14 years later. And, th- and that didn't happen just now. I mean, that happened about, we started to see that maybe six, seven years ago. So there's been that distinction again. It wasn't always like that. That's interesting because a lot of the things that we were talking about last week was, well, we're not going to be able to change the, like, that's not going to change, right? The market is the market, right? Well, technically, the market does change. And this is a great example. I mean, 800 to thousands of dollars in difference. And it wasn't always like that. So it definitely like lays claims to this being true. So considering this Hulk 180-181 benchmark, it's my opinion that we're not changing that one. That's, that's done. All right? It's going to be an uphill battle. So if that's the benchmark, we need to compare other appearances to that cameo versus full appearance. And that definitely makes me feel differently about some major keys that are likely in members' collections. Venom. I'm thinking Venom, like 300. Spider-Man, 299, like 300. How he, It's kind of the same thing. Like He shows up at the, in the last part of the book, the last page. You get, you get a little tease of him. You get the, the full body appearance of the character at the end. It There's says Venom more, at the bottom. More than one panel. Yeah, and and then again in the following issue, there is more. The whole storyline is revolving around that character. He's got more of you know a, an appearance in the whole issue. So, the difference between cameo, full appearance, first full appearance, it can get it can get confusing for people. Well, and he's not even on the cover of three hundred. That's a really good point. I mean, like I knew that, but in this context, thinking about it like that, technically with Hulk one eighty one eighty one as the benchmark, and if I'm going to stand by what I said. In this moment, I don't think 300 is the first full appearance of Venom. He has a full page spread in 299. 299 is the first full appearance of Venom. Let me know what you think about this in the comment section below, comic fam. I totally agree with what you're saying here, because if we're going to set Hulk 180 as that benchmark, where we have Wolverine, last panel in the book, you have his name, and that's still the considered the cameo, but in 299, you're going to have an entire page with the character's name Venom, and in a few panels on the page prior, how do you not call that the first appearance? Jeff, this book is freaking awesome. Tell us about Venus, issue number 19. So this book, Venus 19, is the last issue in the run. It was 1 through 19, all right? It's a fantastic series, and it morphed. It started off with kind of this humor, romance type of feel. Different covers completely than this. This yeah. is an com- extreme horror. The last look like a romance yeah, comic the, to me. The last three covers are horror. This is but, Bill Everett, isn't it? Yeah, that's Bill Everett. He did issues 13 through 19. But like I mentioned, the other ones started off kind of romance humor, eventually into a little bit of sci-fi, and then it just completely 
jump to that. And this is one of the most sought after horror covers, especially from the Atomic Age. Yeah, I love the Atomic Age. That's when stuff really started to pop. Yeah, I'm, I'm a huge fan. Uh, I love the romance in there. I love the horror stuff that we're seeing here. Uh, some great sci-fi. This was done by Atlas Marvel at the time and definitely one of the more classic covers. And for this story in here, and we really should jump into it, this isn't exactly how it happens. That's on the cover. It isn't actually what plays out in the story. Yeah, like a lot of times they try to captivate you off the bookshelf or comic stand to get these things, right? But some of it's true. The blonde haired gal Venus is in the story. <laughs> that part's true. Yeah. The skull faced figure, he's in the story. And it kind of starts off with a seance. And this witch doctor, wizard guy brings back to life this gentleman's long lost love from a wartime. That's right. And when she comes back as this skeleton maiden, he approaches her and rips off his own face, showing that he's a skeleton as well. And they embrace in a kiss. Story ends. You know, because they're trying to bring back his long lost love. And all of a sudden, this like dead skeleton arises, and you're thinking, oh no, this isn't going to be good. Like, this isn't what this guy wants. Oh, Bruce Willis style. He's a skeleton too, the whole time. He was dead the whole time. I want to read this, but I I don't want to open it. So I'll I'll just have, that's going to have to do it for me. You guys, a little summary. He removes the mask of a life from his face. Looks like a Pez dispenser. Kind of does. Just back up like that. Skeletons need love too. Now, if you enjoy Golden Age topics, you got to hit the Comic Tom 101 blog because this guy is dropping some dope articles. Yeah, I just dropped my first article, which is the first masked hero in American comics. So definitely check that out. I'm actually going to write an article on the Venus series as well. So check that out. That'll be out probably around the time this thing drops Sunday. All right, let's talk about hot keys. This is a category on the Key Collector app. Keys that are trending up in demand. This is like what's going on right now. These are the books that are on people's spec radar and keys that are going up in value. And we got to talk about Batwing issue number 19. Speculating. I thought that was bad. No, speculating. I don't really like speculators. Oh, we're going to get to that, this conversation. Like we're going to get to speculators in a little bit, but you know, stay tuned and hit the subscribe button. If you haven't done it already, we talk a lot about comic books. We want you here for the ride. What's going on with Luke Fox. Batwing 19 is in the hot keys section right now. It's uh, the first appearance of Luke Fox, who becomes the second Batwing in issue uh, 20 of this run. So right after issue 19. What's the spec on this? People are thinking that he might become Batman pretty soon here in the uh, in the current Batman series. They may take over as the role. Interesting stuff. In the Batwoman series or the Batman series? In the Batman comic series, but they're also talking about uh, he's definitely going to be in the show, too, in the Batwoman TV show. Yeah, I saw that trailer. It looks interesting. I'm not a big CW fan, but I'm excited to see Bat something happen on television, especially with Gotham ending. Yeah, that show never appealed to me anyway, but I, I was, I'm was i a little more tolerant of the CW shows than, than you were, I think, so uh, the, Batwoman could be cool. Sounds like it's filling in a cool chapter, a cool corner of that universe that hasn't really been touched on yet. One of the things that I really enjoy, regardless of like who the main character is, is the other characters that they incorporate into the show because if the series is even somewhat successful we get these like little like offsprings of shows like you get these other side shows and there's so many batman characters there's so many dcu stuff that i want to see hit the screen that it makes me excited so i'm going to definitely give it my time i'm a little worried the trailer it's i don't, I don't think it's really for me but yeah that's and i don't really I felt like too i don't feel like any of the cw shows are for me maybe flash i really like flash that's a fun and one. now that you mentioned it i'm thinking about the side characters from flash and the side characters from arrow and i like them a way way a lot more than than i like the main characters of either of those shows we just need more people from prison break man right that's pretty much it just bring that back exactly okay and lost <laughs> <laughs> i had to work it in always with the lost stuff it's gonna happen all right Something else that's going to happen, 2020. We got Bloodshot happening. Oh. B-C-U. Ooh. That's what I'm talking about. Valiant Comic Universe. What do you think about this? Vin Diesel, my man. I, I, I'm in love with any new universe for comics. So yeah. I'm until I see it fail, I'm going to have hopes that it's going to succeed. I'm going to be optimistic about it. Like DC, I'm down because of their track record. VCU, I'm going to give them a fresh start and be like, okay, I'm excited. Bloodshot, let's do it. I mean, you got this super soldier who's been basically created and maybe it's not the most original, but his design is great. I think Vin Diesel could pull it off. I like Vin Diesel. What do you think about Vin Diesel? 
I like them in Pitch Black. Hell yeah, dude. Chronicles of Riddick, brother. I don't know about all the Chronicles of Riddick, but Pitch Black for sure. That's I good, man. That's all good. When that first came out, man, I was like, whoa. I like, sold my DVD copy and put the money towards the proceeds to get my Blu-ray. Adulting. I <laughs> don't think I'm a, I'm a Vin Diesel person, but I don't know if that's going to surprise anybody. Dude, I thought you had three X's tattooed on the back of your neck. Uh, and all over my neck. That wasn't yeah. usually. You can't see those? They're all, They're there. That's my new neck tat. Now, what I'm pumped about is that Looper. You guys know this YouTube channel? Giant YouTube channel. Oh, I thought I, you meant the Hayden Christensen film. No, that's actually made by no. DMG, which different is... Looper. Also, no, well, okay. It all ties together because DMG no, Looper, had to Leaper. do... I'm thinking of a different movie. Looper's the one with Bruce Willis, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And Joseph Gordon-Levitt? Yeah. What the hell is a Hayden Christensen movie where he's like jumping through time? I'm forgetting my movies. Back to the Future. No, no, no. It's no, a no, really you're crappy movie the, uh, he made after the Star Wars prequels when he was still trying to have a career. The one. Jumper. Jumper. You're thinking of I'm Jumper getting, with Samuel okay. Jackson. Yeah. I didn't see it, but yeah. Okay, but it's still though. Anyway. Looper. Looper. There's two different loopers here because Looper is a film that DMG had to do with and they also are the ones bringing the Valiant universe to the screen. Okay. So it all kind of ties together. But Looper, the YouTube channel, 5 million subs, gotcha. right? Yeah, they, they did a Bloodshot like announcement. You know, they had some like stuff. They're like, oh, let's catch you up on all things Bloodshot because this movie's coming out and Vin Diesel's like, you know, looks good. What's going on? Well, they totally cited Key Collector for like news on potential characters that we're going to see in the film. These are just some of the leaked details surrounding the Bloodshot movie. In July 2018, sources told Key Collector Comics that two villains would appear in Bloodshot. Harbinger issue number three. This is the first appearance of Axe. And this is a confirmed villain in the franchise that is going to be in the movie. Yeah, he plays a really key role in the comics. And I don't know if I can spoil it or not. What do you guys say? I have not experienced any Valiant comics whatsoever. I'm going to stay out of the spoil. Please. Good but he plays, a, he plays a big role. So chances of him being part of the series are pretty high. And Harbinger issue number three actually had a mail-away pink slip on the inside of the book that you could pull out to send in to get a copy of issue number zero. So if you want a complete copy of that, you got to have that pink slip in it. Look for that pink slip, guys. It's important. Then we have issues number two and three of Bloodshot that you got to be keeping an eye out for. Yeah, they're the first cameo and full appearance of the Chainsaw Pod. The Chainsaw Pod? Don't you mean the, the team, the, the gaggle? Like the mercenary gang, the group of mercenaries? Yeah, the, the flock, the murder, Chainsaw. And both of these books are fairly reasonably priced. Viewer comments. Viewer comments. My favorite part? That's oh, pretty cool. It's probably my favorite part, too. What's the first one, Ryan? It's from Jay Z. The oh. Jay Z is watching your show. Yeah, shout out. No way. It's probably probably a different guy. It might be the real Jay Z. Could be the real. He probably has like a, a fake profile because he doesn't want to be like broadcasting to the world that he's a freaking comic fan of the nerd. show. That's right. Forget the comic book content that is next level. This video, which is our last week's podcast, this video wins solely on the ability to reference three TV shows that are outstanding: The Office, Parks and Recreation, and Lost for the trifecta. That's right. So, In that order. I had to shout that one. Yeah, in terms of uh, quality, worst to best and funniest. Yeah, and best Lost, acting. Lost is also the funniest. and most like replayability. Absolutely, that's, that's Ryan, mm-hmm. I agree. Wait a minute, hold on, nah, <laughs> uh, son of a biscuit. <laughs> All right, what's the next viewer comment from Daily Gron? This is about the uh, the section of our last podcast from the thieves, the comic book thieves. Ooh, the worst. Hmm. The thief cherry picked some valuable Golden Age comics. Someone who knew what they were grabbing, like some kind of I don't know Golden Age guru. Dun, dun, dun. Me? <laughs> I was there. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. He was in the... Uh. You were there, dude. Uh. I was. That's terrible, man. I remember... I, Richie's a good guy. And oh, you know his, him? Yeah. And, and oh, his wife I didn't is, know that. Oh, his wife's uh. freaking amazing. She's a doll. And their son's name is Jeff, too. So it's pretty Dang. awesome. Dang it. That's like seriously surprising me that you knew him, but That's I'm a also... a solid alibi. Yeah, for Probably right. not Jeff. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> no. There you go. And I don't think those books were as cherry-picked as you think they are, because... Yeah. Those are some random freaking books, and I know how the setup works, so I just uh, I think it was just kind of grab what's there because that's the insider mishmash. information yeah. too. I'm starting just, to really think it's Jeff. I'm starting yeah, to really but, think we have the thief right here. Yeah, you guys never met Richie. Oh man, no, I did not. You got to introduce me, man. That's that's interesting that you know him. And sorry to Richie, geez, like that hits close to home, and uh, it makes it that much worse. So hope you get your ASMs back and all that other golden age goodness. Sir, Glad sir. we were able to help shine a light on that last week. Third comment: Raven homicide. Kate's is killing it on Twitter right now about Dylan. This ties into what we were talking about earlier. Yeah. He says, issue seven is first appearance, not nine. And I'm sorry, but the market does not dictate this. The market does not own the IP. 
That's like telling Disney that Shadows of the Empire is still canon. Oh, man. Star Wars talk. That, that hits a little close to home. I love Shadows of the Empire. If Marvel says 180 is the first, it's 180. Now I wait for ASM 299, first Venom. Well, this is extremely, extremely relevant. It's almost like I picked it for a reason. That's right. But, <laughs> but here's the issue. Like, they've already, they contradicted themselves. All of them have, including Marvel. You know, they've said that it's a cameo. They've said it's a first appearance. It's all problematic. You but, can't win, and it's just going to continue for, for the rest of time. The debate rages on. But we're going to be here, and we're going to keep reporting on it. Fourth comment. Gordon Yarn Jr. Ultrasound of your baby versus actual baby. <laughs> first full appearance, always. <laughs> I love it. That one was really good. That's really good. I like that one. Which one is the first appearance? <laughs> Technically, that's like a cameo, right, of your, of your baby versus, you know, the actual first glorious full appearance of your, your new child. All right. I don't know. You're the dad at this table, Jeff. What do you think? Oh, it was real the second I saw a photo. Yeah. See? Oh, when my I, God. Look okay. at this. Just so you know, Whoa. it got really real the second you saw oh a photo. Oh, my God. Your... I got chills just now. Just uh-huh. letting you know. Oh, man. But not as real it was when that baby came out. Dude, the debate <laughs> rages on. No drive was more stressful for me than the drive home from the hospital with the baby for the first time. Oh my goodness! Oh my gosh. It seemed I like never everybody. About that. Yeah, it seemed like everybody was going a million hours per, hours per hour. Slow down. A, a million miles per hour when you're just trying to get home. And everyone looks like a reckless driver, and then now you have to like parent without any nurse help and like go. I love these like personal types of stories. I didn't even know about that. And if yeah. you like these types of personal stories, we're gonna do a special after show because you know we do it every single week after the show ends it doesn't actually end we turn the cameras off we keep talking because this show is broadcasted on spotify stitcher soundcloud and itunes and we have some more segments that we keep talking and today we're going to talk about what we like to do when it's not comic books wow other things that we enjoy so if you want to hear that portion head over to the audio portion check it out we're gonna be talking about ourselves we hope you enjoy it. Just like you're going to find out right now about how much I enjoy this next fast food restaurant. Glorious segue. That's right. We had something amazing happen. Jeff had a link to an article. It was about Venom. It was about more Donny Kate stuff. He even said in parentheses, I don't know if I want to talk about Donny Cates <laughs> again. Again. So like you maybe want to throw this out. But I'm like, all right, I'm going to check it out. So I clicked on it, and it was the wrong link. And I am so happy it was the wrong link because Tony Stark is no more, all right? He's gone in the MCU, but there is hope. We have a new Iron Man, and that Iron Man showed himself to the world this week. It was the one and only Iron Taco. This cosplayer, nerd alert cosplay, he, he did it. He made the best cosplay that I've ever seen. Makes me hungry. Okay, this is what he said. I am Iron Taco. After finally assembling all of the infinity... <laughs> can't even say All the infinity sauces to complete my Belgrande Gauntlet Supreme, <laughs> I can finally help the McVengers cure the world from bland, boring food. And if you can't see this, because you're listening to this, you, it's, it's a, a complete Iron costume suit and this infinity <laughs> gauntlet of condiments on his hand he's got the sauces for gems the man sauces for gems the different like sauces the, the fire sauce and the mild sauce and oh, it's just the name of it the gauntlet supreme the grande <laughs> gauntlet supreme made me crack up this is that's, the best that's man perfect taco bell that's exactly how they name everything there it taco sounds... bell you found your new mascot this is top tier fast food for me guys this is i i put pet taco bell on a pedestal it's to me this isn't really fast food like it's fast but it's like you got like mcdonald's and all that but then you have tacos and that's not i feel guilty for how high a taco bell ranks in my personal preference of fast food locations cheesy gordita crunch game set match like that's it that's case, it case dude. closed i haven't had taco bell in a long time but when oh. i did i was a seven layer burrito kind of guy i don't even know if they we still should have get that. taco bell as a sponsor next yeah fourth meal guys can we arrange that use code tom 101 to, yeah, get, get, a to free... get a free burrito <laughs> and you know who else loves Taco Time? Who? Sylvester Stallone. And Taco Wesley Time or Taco Bell? Because I'm... There's a difference. There's a big difference. There is a big that. difference. I eat a lot more Taco Time than Taco Bell. I'm sorry. Oof. You're I, all freaking... Can I stay on the show? Yeah, Stay the cool. Golden Age Guru likes Taco right. Time. Who would have thought? Sorry about big that. Spender. He's like, I need $15 tacos. 
<laughs> They're good though. They're actually really good. But Sylvester Stallone and Wesley Snipes. And they like Demo- Taco Time or Taco Bell? Taco Bell. Okay, okay. Did sure. you guys never see Demolition Man? That was the only fast food chain that survived in the future. Oh, Taco Bell. that's right. They would. I totally forgot. And they would because that meat doesn't go old. Yeah. Probably because it's so authentic. That 7-Eleven freaking cheese never goes old either. Mm-mm. Let's move on because I have something here that's kind of makes... It gives me the heebie-jeebies, to be honest. Like this, it's a little unsettling. I don't really know why because this is a character I really enjoy. We did a giveaway last week and we're going to announce the giveaways this week here pretty soon. But we're talking about the thing. What's under... The Thing's rocks. Like when they redid the Fantastic Four movie franchise, like that one terrible movie that we want to all forget, they changed the canon a little bit and say that, no, his rock formation is like internal organs are even rocks. Like they they just made him all rock. But that's not how he is in the MCU. And this conversation is being brought up today because of Fantastic Four issue number 13. Is that the one where the Hulk, uh, the Hulk fights the Thing? That's right, Dan Slott. Yeah, from that new round. Yeah, Thing and Immortal Hulk go head to head. We actually find out who is stronger in this battle. And we'll reveal that in a second. But in the trading of blows that they take, the Hulk smashes the Thing's face and breaks the rocks through. And we see what's underneath. I just thought the rocks were his skin. Right? I didn't think there was anything underneath. I mean, like organs, I guess. Somewhere in there, there's got to be organs. Yeah, it's interesting. You look at it. God, and it's pink, fleshy, sore, it looks like. It's so hard to look at. This man is a monster. Yeah, so, I mean, it humanizes him because he's no longer just rock. You actually get to see flesh, but it's hard to see our hero like that. And he's fighting on his wedding day for his love. So that just makes it all that more vulnerable and important. Yeah, the thing, he has like one week a year where he reverts back. So during this fight, he's literally got a watch that's counting down until he reverts back. So he's got to fight the Hulk who is being controlled by the puppet master. They go head to head. The thing gets his, like most of his fates like just blown off. And this actually has happened before in comic books, but not by the Hulk, by another character that Ryan absolutely adores. Wolverine? Yeah. Is it Wolverine? It's Wolverine. Oh, I was was kidding, but I guess it is Wolverine. Yeah, we have two issues of Fantastic Four to talk about, and it's kind of funny because this is misnumbered on a lot of sites when referencing this little story arc of when the thing first gets his innards revealed. So we all know Wolverine's got adamantium claws, and he literally slices through Thing's face in Fantastic Four 374. That's right. But... It's left of that cliffhanger. Yeah, he's like cowering. He's like, ah, oh, my face hurts, you know? Because he's got like, Wolverine's got an anger problem, you know? Just kind of think, probably thinking like he's not going to hurt him. We don't see till 375 the damage that was caused. And we see it big time. It's like half a page splash of this hamburger face. Literally looks like ground beef yeah. hanging off the side of the thing's face. It's rough, man. It gives me the willies. That, that This dude looks like a turtle, like a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle, like a mutant underneath that rock. Yeah, it's like Krang is coming out of his face in some fashion to the point where he actually has to put on a metal mask through the issue. And I don't know if that's just to ease the, the readers or for his own protection. Yeah, it's it's pretty, pretty gut-wrenching because you see just like... You know, he's always dealing with this stuff. Like he's a monster. It's so bad. But then it's like, no, no, it's actually worse under the rock. The rock is almost like, it's almost a nice thing that he has the stone to cover the mutant aspect of what's underneath. Now he fights the Hulk and the rocks don't just leave his face in this fight. The thing does a full knockout punch. Like just, lays the Hulk out. He knocks the Hulk out. He wins the fight. The Thing can take out the Hulk, but not without taking a lot of the pain himself. Yeah, I mean, he made contact with the Hulk so viciously and ferociously, and literally at the last second before his he's going to revert to uh, just a full-fledged human, that all the rocks on his arm just evaporated and fell off. And we have, again, this pinky, fleshy limb. Pinky, pinky fleshy limb. That's what's underneath the thing's rocks. And knocks out the Hulk. 
Yeah. How cool is that, though? I mean, the Hulk is is crazy strong, and he's even stronger now than he was written before. But still, in today's modern writing, the thing has enough power to take him out. And look, let's be real. It's Immortal Hulk. He's shown right now to be so incredibly powerful. But because he's being controlled by the Puppet Master, he is a little bit more vulnerable. Sure. So it isn't the true full Hulk. So those of you who are going to be out there like, oh, how do you take out Immortal Hulk? He was a little bit um, manipulated, so not at full strength. Maybe we'll see more fights in the future. I think Hulk's your crush, crush thing every time, personally. Yeah? No, no, no. I didn't realize that it was Puppet Master who's behind all this, too, because that's incidentally, that happens to be the father of uh, the thing's wife. So there, that brings a little bit of a weird kind of family drama into this. Should be, should be fun. I'm excited to actually read that since I've been actually collecting that run. I just have not been reading it. Get to it later. Throwing punches. Fighting. Uh-oh. Arguments. Let's, let's talk about another touchy subject. Speculation. Don't say that. Speculators. You have to bleep that word out of your mouth. Right? That's right. It makes me so mad. So angry. Okay, this is an issue. Like, no I mean, issue, right? no pun, but, but this is a problem. This is a severe problem in the comic book community, in comic book selling, collecting, and investing. Yeah, speculators are going to bring the whole market down. Right? This Just is like the, 90s the 90s all over again. Exactly. That's what I thought. Specul haters. This is an article ran by Key Collector on the Comic Tom 101 blog that everybody needs to read. ComicTom101.com slash blog. Okay, so we got to just like lay into it. There are stores, there are people, there are publishers who legit hate speculators. They don't want flippers to exist. And they have this false idea that the comic book community who buys papered comics, like actual in-hand comic books, are going to cause the death of this community. And I just think that's so flat out incorrect. Yeah, I mean, it's common to hear that we are going to go down like the 90s. Let's address that right now because it's one of like the most frustrating things that I hear about critiques of the show and what we do with our collecting. We put money into comic books beyond cover price, right? Let's chat about how that is just flat out wrong. Yeah, we're not seeing 5 million copy print runs. That's right. X-Force number one back in the 90s. One comic book. 5 million print run. Let that sink in. Because right now, what do we got? Do you understand 2018, the top selling title, if you took it for the entire year, all 12 months, would only add up to 2.8 million copies. That's the top selling title of every month. Not just one title in 1990s. So like you had together five the, million. the January top selling comic plus the February top selling comic all the whole year? Yep. The whole year. Okay. okay. I just had to get that sorted out in my brain. Yeah. yeah. So let's put perspective on, on print runs here. Okay. And then- It's wh- like one tenth of what was happening yeah. back in the 90s. This is a com- that's a completely different thing. It, you can't compare it. It's apples and oranges. And it will likely never happen again. I can't imagine it happening again. And we'd be the first people to tell you if it was happening again. And people are speculating in that time frame. And they were speculating on a lot of things. Yeah. At that time, people were trying to make a quick buck on what they can. Okay. Yeah, like, it wasn't just comics. No, there was Beanie Babies. There was, like you meant, McDonald's toys. Baseball cards. Pokemon football cards. cards yeah. Everything. Anything and everything that they thought that they could make some type of money on because... They just thought it could be hot, and we can speculate on it. And it's a different time now. People, people are still trying to make some money, but it's not easy. Well, someone else who thinks it's not very easy is Jim Lee. He was at a recent panel. This is what he said. It's paraphrased because this is a member in the audience. He said something along the lines of this. A couple weeks ago, I went to a comic book store, and they tried to pick up a copy of House of X. It was a Friday, and there were no copies available, and he shakes his head. How are we supposed to have a growing comic book market if we can't even get the copies two days after it comes out? Sorry, Jim. It's not the best way to look at your own industry. Your average comic store isn't really going to be able to stock that many extra copies in addition to what their customers have already pre-ordered. Yeah, you can't expect to come into a shop on one of the hottest titles and pick it up two, three days after the comic just came out. You're not the only one who didn't get a copy. So... It's unfortunate, but everyone who did get a copy planned ahead. And those who didn't, they just didn't. So it's, it's important to be able to plan 
because if you want to get lucky with getting a really hot title at cover price, it takes a little more effort than just showing up and hoping that it's there. Unless you're going to come every Wednesday. Right. If you can't, then you got to expect you're going to miss something. Let's chat about Immortal Hulk. This will put a kibosh on the impact that speculators have in saying that it's a negative impact on the community. This chart shows print counts of Immortal Hulk. This was one of the hottest comic books of the year. Ryan, where did we start out with this title? Looks like uh, comic book shops altogether ordered 84,000 copies right. of the first issue. This was uh, pre-orders and people coming in to get more than one issue. This is very common because by the second issue, we saw a steep drop to 43,000 copies ordered. But that's normal. That is normal. They normally get a bunch of copies of issue one and then... You know, from there, it's up to the fans of the series, the you know people who continue to read it to kind of keep the momentum going. I want to throw a caveat that this chart doesn't talk about is co- conventions. Obviously, we go to a lot of conventions. Jeff, you go to multiple conventions. What was being talked about all last year? Issue one and issue two. They were the top two books. I mean, obviously, the Mortal Hulk one and then the first appearance of Dr. Fry. That's right. I remember going table to table and having dealers ask me if I had copies because they wanted to stock up because every other customer who was asking about Hulk was asking about particular issues from this run because the run was so hot and people wanted to pay way more money than cover price on these issues. Now that's something that we see on the convention floor. So seeing like the customers in person over and over and over again, as well as the dealers who deal with these comic books, we see it a little differently because it It shows us that the evidence is there, that the speculators and people who are collecting, they're helping drive this comic book to success. I'm still frustrated. I still need like the first five or six issues of this run. It's bugging me. That's right. Well, you actually bought more than just the first prints of a lot of these. I didn't get on Immortal Hulk until like issue seven or eight. And I'm kicking myself for waiting that long because Hulk isn't really a character that appeals to me. And I didn't jump on it at the the beginning like I should have. Well, a lot of people didn't jump on it because between issue two and issue 14, we saw basically static growth of this run. One of the hottest runs of the year, static. It just kind of hovered in the $40,000 or 40,000 copy range. That's right. 40,000 until issue 14. What happened at issue 14? That's when you get like the Betty Ross stuff, like the She-Hulk harpy spec. That's right. Go back through our portfolio of content. There are videos where we are talking we go over live on a live show i remember that right with the day that issue came out i said that betty ross dies takes a bullet in the head spoiler alert and i said it right afterwards and that's right i got yelled at a little bit in the comments rightfully so it blew up we were be- getting asked to put it in the mystery mail call we were being asked you know do we have copies people on instagram were tagging us people were hunting she hulk red she hulk issues down for the first time in over a decade it blew up how did it affect the numbers well Here on the graph, we can see that between issue 14 and issue 15, we saw a small hike, close to like five to 10,000 in ordered comics. But here's the thing. The reveal wasn't in issue 15. The reveal of what happened was in issue 16. But speculators were involved, right? So they hurt the market. We're not going to see this impact the run in a positive way. It couldn't have gone up that much between issue 15 and 16, right? Wrong. Yeah, 90,000 copies ordered. More than issue number one did. Yeah, that's a little crazy. And I mean, part of it is because this comic is like an outlier in terms of how good it is. Like, you don't, you don't get comics like Immortal Hulk quality every day. So, I mean, part of it is because the comic itself is spectacular and a bunch of people were jumping on throughout the run. But that is such a steep hike that something else has to be going on. Yeah, at a relevant moment in the storyline. So I don't think that's just a coincidence. Granted, I think the reason that number two, that the issues from two on stayed stagnant and didn't continue to drop because, you you know, you tend to lose readership. That's true. Right? Two, three, four, it, it drops. I mean, that stayed, like you said, static. Right. I mean, that's a, that's a big feat, I think, in comics these days. And to keep that much readership to the point where they were interested in knowing what's going to happen at 15 and 16, mm-hmm. to dive all in like that, I mean, that's that says a lot about the story. Now, we don't have numbers for anything past 21 just yet because those haven't been released yet. But as we're sitting right now, those copies ordered actually stayed above 75,000 up until the most recent 
issue number 21, which still landed at close to 55,000 copies ordered, which is a full 15,000 more than the 2 to 14 that we originally just quoted. It's pretty recent, too. I mean, issue 23 just dropped today as we're recording this, so it's we're gonna pretty see this up to the minute. Yeah. yeah. So clearly, speculation has helped this particular run, and I'd be hard-pressed to find you an example of when it didn't. And the fact that we have stores and publishers, independent publishers, that are doing anything but being positive to individuals who are spending their money on not just comic books, because remind you, they don't have to buy in-hand comic books. They don't even have to go to the comic book store at all. They can go digital, right? I mean, if it's really all about reading, why not just put the issues online and have your comics sell, right? Because if your comic book could do so well, if you want, really want people to just read your comic, they should just go online and read it, right? I mean, look, I mean, I say put out your book, have it published. I mean, you never know what you're, what's going to be a hit. And if it hits, great. Don't be upset at who bought your book. I would be more proud that people are specking on a book because they're specking because I'm assuming, A, the art's good or the story's great or something is there. All right. And then if you want to make adjustments on your next issue, great. If you're upset that it's not hitting a wider base of people who can enjoy your book and you're not going to grow that base, then put it up on your website. If you want to expose your issue so people can get it for free because that's what you want to do, then great, more power to you. But don't complain. You know, be happy, be proud, make adjustments, move on. Like, come on, guys. Especially the independent publishers. This is what really grinds my gears because it's one thing to have like Marvel and DC not really understand this because they're dealing with such large numbers and there's a lot of things that they're focusing on. You know, they have variants to put out. But independent publishers, like we're talking in publishers that have under a 10,000 print count for issues number one. I mean, when as much as like 20 plus percent of their audience aren't even reading the comic books that they picked up, and I bet that's a low percentage, but I'm being conservative here. It's just appalling to me. It's like, come on, you're like backhanding the people who are making your comic have any light shine on it because there is so much content being made every single month. I mean, I'll put a link here to Rags. I had a whole conversation with the creators of Rags and I had to like call them out. It's like, why are you talking down to the speculators that literally made your comic book popular? And guess what? They acknowledged that they made a mistake on camera in the video. Thank you for watching this show. Do not forget, we are sponsored by Key Collector Comics. And if you use the coupon code TOM101, you get a one week free subscription. It's definitely worth it. Best app on the market. Also, we're sponsored by, well, you know, it's us. It's you help and support the show directly by joining the mystery mail call, the comic book subscription service. Links in the bio to sign up. We send you comic books every month. And yeah, get a little uh, box of fun every month on your doorstep. We've got giveaways. Three of them from last week's podcast. First giveaway is the Thing comic that was on the wall behind Tom there. I should probably give away something else too. So while you guys do that, I want to pick something up. Cool. The Thing comic is going to Otto Octavius. Next up is one of the Marvel Comics Presents. That's going to Brick Hunter for leaving a comment on last week's podcast. Thank you. Last but not least, Milk Dog. You get Marvel Comics Presents as well. We got three giveaways for today's video. This one's coming from The Wall, Spider-Man 17. This is my one of my favorite crossover events from the Infinity Gauntlet. We also have, kind of in theme, we have a bloodshot signed by John Boy going out to one lucky member. And then we have some gold because, I mean, Jeff, you talked about gold, so we got to give us some Comic Karma away, but some Golden Age style. Yeah, we got some Daredevil. And this is not that Silver Age Daredevil. This is the Golden Age Daredevil. Classic prison scene, hanging front cover. Love it. Really underrated cover, if you ask me. As always. Keep responsible. Enough said.